Number four of My Dad Used to Play Hockey. I'm your host, uh, Zach Kidrichuk. So career stats for my next guest are kind of weird. Uh, zero games played, zero goals, uh, zero assists. So no penalty minutes, a plus minus of, of zero. Uh, and yet has been part of thousands of Flyers games. Uh, the Flyers public announcement addresser, uh, announcer since the 1972-73 season. Welcome, Lou Nolan. Hi, Lou. How you doing? I'm doing well, Zach. Thanks for having me on the show. I don't know if you remember. Of course you don't, but I do. Only because my brother reminds me of it all of the time. Uh, the first time I ever met you in person, and of course I had heard your voice hundreds of times at that point, <laughs> but it was it was you know, on the way to the locker room. I think you were on the way to the ice, and I was with my dad and my brother, and we were passing, and he introduced us, and I think I was probably nine or ten. And uh, what all I could summon to say to you, the only thing I could think of was, I like your voice. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's yes. the ultimate compliment, you know, <laughs> especially from a nine or 10 year old. Yeah. So here we are all these years, years later, 30 years later. And Lou, I still like your voice. God bless you. I love it. <laughs> I want to, I'm, I'm, I want to know about how you become a, public uh you know how you become the voice of the flyers uh because you know I've, I've talked to a few players now and then they they have they have players they grew up idolizing you know they wore their jerseys and and everything how is it that a young man decides that you know what i want to do i want to announce those players coming onto the ice well zach i don't think uh that was my initial goal um <laughs> I, uh, uh, when I was younger and I was younger once, uh, I, I always watched the original six. They were on TV. I'm not sure what channel it was, but there weren't that many channels. One of three, and, right? Um, yeah. Three channels. And, um, I watched all the hockey games and I love hockey and, uh, played a lot of street hockey behind a school and used to go to the game with the Ramblers, which was a team in the Eastern league in Philly on Friday nights with a classmate of mine from grade school, whose uncle was a goal judge. So we'd go up there and we were rink rats. We ran around the rink and did what we did. And he left us alone and everything was fine then. And, you know, we, we get the broken sticks at the end of the game and bring them home and tape them up and make something for a puck, shoe polish can, uh, you know, one of the guy's dads would cut round things and use them. And we played behind the school. So, uh, that was where it all started. Uh, I, um, and then, you know, through high school and so forth, I, uh, uh, I remember going down, uh, when I left school and went down the beach or the shore, as we call it, uh, yes, in, yes, uh, in Margate and, uh, on the way down the highway route 42, there was a big, uh, a big billboard there that said the flyers are coming and it had a logo on it. And I said, Hey, you know, NHL hockey. I said, this is, this is pretty cool. So I, maybe someday I'll go to some games. So I get to the beach and I'm there, I don't know, for a while. And maybe the first year or second year I was there, I meet a guy named Joe Cadillac, who mm. uh, you probably know that name very well. well. Very well. There's a guy who would have stories. I don't know what he could tell you, but there's a guy with stories. <laughs> and uh, Joe, uh, uh, Joe and I went out and uh, he got the job as the first PR director. He was with the Daily News paper in Philly. And we went out to celebrate, hit a couple of bars and had some strange drinks and a few beers. And I became Joe's friend and I said, you know, Joe, if you ever need any help, let me know. You know, I've, I've, I've watched the original six and this and that and the other. And he didn't know what he was getting into and, and whatever. But he said, I'll oh, come to this cocktail party. It's the introduction party. You know, why not? So I went and um, I started working in the press box for home games for uh, uh, the games at the Spectrum. Uh, just handing out stats and things like that and making sure the right people got the right pieces of paper and so forth. And uh, uh, then I sort of graduated to announcing goals on the phone uh, at, uh, at the, um, in the press box. And uh, what do you mean on the phone? Well, we, we would recap things on the phone. Okay. We'd pick up the phone and recap on a PA to all the guys in the box what the goal was case they missed it on the ice. I don't know how they could have missed it because Gene Hart was the original guy that, that did it. 
Uh, then he would come upstairs and do the third period on the radio. So um, they couldn't have missed much from Gene. Gene was the best. No. And uh, so I, I did some of those things. And uh, uh, when the announcer left, I said uh, to uh, Lou Scheinfeld, who I, uh, who I had met and was a Flyers VP there, second under Ed uh, Snyder, I said, I want to do that. Now, the reason I wanted to do that was I wanted to be able to see the goals. There weren't lots of TVs all over like there are now. If you've been to press boxes, you see it. Every writer can see replays, uh, TVs. The TV guys are all the same. And there weren't just weren't that much TVs or coverage by TV. So uh, I wanted to see them. And I'd be always be writing down goals and hear roar. And, you know, I missed, uh, I missed a lot of goals those first few years, mm -hmm. believe me. And, um, you know, I went in to, for a, uh, uh, Lou said, okay, well, so come on in and we'll hear what you sound like on a PA. I went in, it was when they were putting the third level on our building, um, the spectrum, uh, it hung it from the outside and, uh, geez, they had the, the ice was not up, up the ice was, was, was up rather. And there was, uh, a lot of dirt that they used big cranes in and just was up when I went over to get the microphone. They turned the turned it on, you know. <laughs> so I said, "Excuse me, guys, I'm here for an audition. It's important. Could you turn the crane down for a minute?" Ying, 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 ying. So they did. They turned it off, and Lou says, "You got it. Come on up." He said, "If that doesn't bother you, nothing will bother you." Yeah. Then the first game I did, I got hit with a bucket of ice. the uh, The pucks were used to be in a bucket of ice before we had a freezer, and one player threw the threw the whole bucket of ice. Somebody from Oakland, I guess. I don't remember. And I got hit with that. So it was like a very interesting way to come into the league. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of games since then. I used to work without glass, which was interesting. Got nailed a few times. But, uh, you know, got to watch your dad, boy. He was some player. Yeah, he tells me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> were, were there nerves that first game? I, I, I want to oh, know, yeah. about, I wanna know about the first time. Did you – was there a point – because even, you know, I don't know if you're a, a fan of, of Hamilton, but Lin-Manuel Miranda still talks about the nerves, even though he's done the performance so many times. But what, there's a certain part, like once you nail the first thing, you kind of got the rest of the show. Is there is there a part, was there a part of that, of that first announcing experience where you're like, you know what, I've got the show? Not only was there one then, which lasted probably the entire game, but there's always one now, uh, no matter what I do. Uh, that, that goes out and, and, you know, you gotta be right. You know that, I mean, you gotta be right. So, uh, there's always nerves and it always, uh, uh, feels good when you get into the flow of it. And as you do more games, I mean, I've done a few thousand, I mean, you know, you get better at it, but still that little thing inside you that says, you know, it's dangerous that, um, you know, whatever you do, be careful what you say. Just ask that NHL referee that left his mic open recently. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and all the other referees pretending that never happens. I mean, I, yes, knew, what a, right. I knew what a makeup call was before I knew what offsides was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would get it from your dad, who really knew what they were, because there were a lot of them made uh, back in those days. And Did you, uh, you know, Flyers being what they were then, the bullies, they give some refs a tough time. Uh, okay. So uh, you know, at least they made their penalties obvious. You know, they didn't they didn't try to hide anything. You know, if, oh, they no. gonna, if they were going to get a, a, a two-minute minor, they were going to make it worth it. That's right. It'd be worth the two minutes. And if, if somebody messed around with one of the guys, you know, that couldn't defend themselves, they were all over them, you know, especially Dave Schultz, yep. uh, who, uh, you know, uh, was was the guy out there. And the people they would put out, you know, uh, Moose, Moose DuPont, and, you know, people like that, Zaleski, big guys. I mean, yeah. A lot Celeste, of teams had the Philadelphia flu when they came in there. Said you know. Celeski to a lesser extent. This yeah. is again using my dad as a source. Did, Understood. Uh, they, uh, that was a I like to describe brutal team in a brutal city. Philly is a tough city, and I, I would expect that you started to kind of absorb some of that toughness. Was there was there ever a moment? You know, you're, you're standing there, you know, as the announcer, and there's there's a brawl breaking out on the ice where you're like. I kind of want to jump out there. <laughs> no, I was smarter than that. Uh, but I did realize that, you know, uh, they do it for a living. And uh, I mean, I've seen them. I've seen guys, uh, you know, go into stands and fight fans who think they're really tough, you know, and bingo, they're mm -hmm. hit once and knocked down and 
you know, it doesn't happen much anymore because the glass is very high. Uh, it wasn't back then, but, um, we, um, uh, we used to do a lot of that stuff like that and really defend our teammates. Uh, uh, and, um, it's sort of out of the game now. You can't do it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very difficult. It, it is. costs you money. Yeah. You get, you get fines. They make a lot and they pay a lot of fines. They do pay a lot of fines. Connor, Connor, poor Connor McDavid just got fined five thousand dollars, which he oh, actually I feel bad for him. He made more money while sitting in the penalty box than he had to pay during the fine. <laughs> <laughs> but he put his elbow right in that guy's face, didn't he? He did. Oh, he yeah. deserved a fine without yeah. a doubt. Without a yeah. doubt. I mentioned at the beginning of this that I liked your voice because uh, I it's so associated. You know, there's two voices. You know, Jim Jackson. I know has been doing it for a long time, but for me. Your voice and Gene Hart's voice; those are those are the two most synonymous to me with the Flyers. And also, you know, apologies to all the other broadcasters, but these are the the two that I that I grew up with. Did you? all when did you get this voice? It's like, uh, did, did this come with puberty, or is did you? What did you do? I didn't I do anything. It. I just uh, whatever it was, it was. Uh, and um, you know, I didn't take lessons. Uh, you know, I've done some lessons for voiceovers and stuff like that since, but I mean, I never, I, I was what I was mm -hmm. and, um, to be mentioned with Gene, uh, is an honor. Um, but, uh, it's, you know, you listen to somebody for a thousand games, I guess you, you have to like them, you know, you have to like them and you have to say to yourself, well, you know, I'll live with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um. But I'm not like the DJ kind of guy, you know, we'll be right back. I'm, I, you know, none of that stuff. None of that stuff. No, no. Just none like our team. It's a, it's a junkyard dog. Bring the info out kind of thing. Yet. Yeah. You, you, Cause you, you know, with a radio DJ and, you know, I work in the radio industry, sure. you're, you're sort of taught, especially I, I started in music and no matter what the song, it's the best song ever. Like, coming oh, yeah. up, Dionne Warwick, like who's really, but what I love, what one of the things I love, one of the aspects I love about what you have to do is when the Flyers go up first or score an overtime goal or anything, obviously you can just bring the enthusiasm, right? Because the, the crowd's cheering as soon as you say the names and the, the, of the goal score and the two, the, you know, the two assists, they're going to go nuts. But then, you know, there's a game like well, it's last night no. where they lose to the Sabres. Uh, snapping the Sabres' 18-game winless streak, and they lost 6-1. So then you have to, you kind of have to adjust your mood a little bit when you're announcing announcing those goals. Is that just something that comes natural, or is that something you practice at all? I I think it comes natural, and if, you know you can relate it to the fact that if somebody's losing the game three nothing or four nothing, and they score a goal, the players don't celebrate the mm -hmm. same way they would with a, uh, you know, uh, an important goal. Uh, and, um, it's just, I mean, I know when I should be excited and I am inside me and I know when I'm not excited and, uh, but I try to be professional about it all. You know, I do try my best to, uh, uh, to bring the goals of the opposition properly, mm -hmm. uh, to properly use names. I study names every night, just make sure I have everybody. And I, I don't want to embarrass anybody that, you know, could be their first NHL goal and I have their name wrong. Right. And they're listening to the tape and it's wrong, you know. So you try to you try to be a real pro if you can. And I, I, most of the time I did it. And the names have gotten more and more difficult. You know, oh. my dad's my dad's must have been amongst or Kinderchuck is for many a mouthful. Well, yeah, yeah, but it, 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 I don't know. I, I, I are you guys Ukrainian? Is that You're what it Ukrainian, is? yeah. 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 Uh, that's easy compared to, um, you know, some of the Slavic names that are out there now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can relate a story to you. Uh, I did the Olympics, uh, in Salt Lake and, um, you know, one of the early games I did, uh, had, had, uh, you know, um, one of the Slavic teams in it and they didn't have, uh, a lot of NHL players. So I knew all the NHL players, I could pronounce all them, but the other ones are tough, you know? And I did Chinese women and I'm doing that. And, um, we're all on headsets and the French guy, you know, you do it in English and then he does it in French. So I'm calling out the lineup and there's no paper. It's all on computer. So I'm calling the names and he says, Louis he says, they're all looking at you. 
one by one, they're looking right at you. Now that's a bad sign, Zach, you know? <laughs> so I realized that the names, I was doing the names backwards. Oh yeah. Like yeah. reading them, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Yep. And, um, we straightened all that out and, and put that to bed and worked that. Uh, but, uh, there've been some good ones. I've been some, uh, do you, how do you, how do you, do they just send you the names phonetically? There, or, well, how, they how, do. what is that process? Yeah. Well, they, they, there's a, there's a phonetical, uh, uh, pronunciation guide. Mike Emmerich used to do it and then the league took it over. Uh, but you can't always rely on it, but, uh, for the most part you can, if it's really a, a, a name that throws me or somebody that's not on my list, uh, you know, back in the day when I was downstairs, cause I'm not now there's protocol. I have to be upstairs until all this COVID stuff's over. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go down and talk to the PR guy from the other team about it. And he would say sometimes, let me go get the player if he didn't know. And the guy would come out and I'd talk to the guy. And um, often I would go to the team's website and listen to the home announcers do a highlight film. You know, they do little highlight clips of goals for certain players, for everybody really. But you know, you can listen to that and hear how they do it and then phonetically get it get ready to do it. But it's homework. You know, it's yeah. homework. We all do it. Was there anyone that you just couldn't nail? Because when when I – there's a there's a quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. His first name is Tua. And I, I will never be able to say his last name properly. And I, uh, apologies to him. Oh, yeah. That's so, Tua, so Tua just, something or other. I So I just do it as quickly as possible. Yeah. Just, just, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a rough time with Ninema at first. Yanni mm -hmm. Ninema. You remember that name for sure. Of course. Uh, I had a rough time with it. I just could not do it. And until I broke it down into syllables and, you know, I mean, for two, three games, he's my guy. I better get it right. And it took a little while. And, um, you know, he was tough. But I like the French names. Uh, they're fun. They're fun to pronounce. Uh, and um, But some of the names get to be difficult that you don't know the player or it's their first game or they bring them up and so forth. And mm -hmm. Uh, but hey, but uh, Ninamo was a tough name. Ninamo hey, was tough. You mentioned you know, he was your guy for two or three games. Do they start to feel like your guys? You know, when when you were, we'll, we'll just start with you know the bullies. Did you did they did you feel like part of the team? I mean, it, it seems like the more people that I talked to from that era, whether you wore the uniform or not, it was like the bullies extended well off the ice. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was. I was about the same age as most of those guys. So, uh, you know, um, if, if I was out or I was over at Rexy's drinking after the game, you know, a lot of guys would go have a cocktail. I mean, I knew these guys intimately and you're friends with the guys. So you become more caught up in everything as fans did there. And, you know, they felt the same way, probably that, you know, they were part of it. And that was a mystique of that team. Uh, that team had a way of, 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 going out and taking you and bringing you in. And that was a real key to the flyers as they grew. But, uh, you know, I, I, I did, uh, some teams I felt closer to some teams I felt farther away from, mm -hmm. uh, this team, I haven't been downstairs with this team, so I don't really know. Uh, and, um, but the last year's team, the young guys, I really got along well with the young guys, although I would, you know, I'm not the same age as them. I'm not out uh, having a beer with them. But uh, you know, it's uh, uh, it's it's different. Surprisingly, Lou, you're the first guest uh, that I've interviewed that brought up Rexies. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about Rexies for a second, because this seems this just seems in today's sports world this seems impossible. Because if you see an athlete out, they're 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 millionaires for the most part. I mean, um, or wealthy, and they're surrounded by their people. They're in a VIP section or whatever. Rexies. Was, it wasn't it wasn't a dive bar, but it was just a bar in Jersey that after yep. the game, the Flyers like the a significant portion of the team would just hang out and have a couple of beers with the fans. Sure, there were there were there were guys that you know sat with certain people after games and ate dinner or something of that nature. But the guys were all over the bar. I mean, there there wasn't anything like that. Uh, later on, um, you know, Rexy's burned. Yeah, and uh, that was a sad day for everybody. But um, build up again, and there was a room, a flyer's room, and you know uh, it was a place that guys could go into if they felt like it and be have a beer with their teammates. Uh, sometimes that there was a lot of that, and sometimes there wasn't. There's some guys, everybody's players, 
players have different personalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that team, well, that team loves the fans. They love the fans because they weren't millionaires. You know, it was a lunch pail no. group. Again, I know that very well. Yeah, yeah. A lunch pail group. And um, it was uh, uh, different than it is now, you know, where minimum somewhere around $800,000 a year, right? Mm-hmm. Something like that. I don't know exactly what it is, but that's the minimum. So you sign a guy like Cam York. They signed him yesterday out of college. He was a college sophomore, captain of his team, Team Canada and all this. You know, the guy's signing a pretty good deal for three years. He's got to be making a pretty good coin, you know, first round draft pick and so forth. Yeah. But the guys that they bring up, um, you know, like Alex Lyon, goaltender, who played last night part of the game. Uh, and, um, you know, just a young guy, went to Yale. Great guy, loves to play hockey. Terrific guy. And, you know, he's not making a ton of money, but where are you going to go and play your sport and be handed, you know, 800 grand? <laughs> Not yeah. too many places. Maybe if there no, are, let no me know. Others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you talk about the the players have that changed. Let's talk about the fans because you've been, you know, obviously not this year. Everything's weird, and as was as was last year. We'll get back to normal eventually. But how how is the fan base when I when I see the fans? You know, you remember the the sign guy, of course. This guy used to make signs and still around. He's still around. Yep. Oh, that makes me so happy. Dave Leonardi uh, is his name. Dave he's Leonardi. Still around. And he's still making signs. Still making signs. Still pulling them right out. He has them all indexed. Boom. <laughs> Opens them right up. And the signs were good signs. Dude. Were- Real smart stuff. Yes. I love start the bus, stuff like that, you know. Uh, that's great to know that there's that there's some there's some mainstays. Uh do yep. you do you tell me how the, how you've seen the fan base sort of shift because I, I try I'm I'm always trying. I've uh, most of my friends don't n- know much about hockey, and struggle to watch it on TV because uh, it's if you don't know the game, it, it's kind of it can be a tough watch on TV. Following it's a, a, hard, l- yeah. a little puck, puck small, yeah. yeah, and you know now we have big TVs and everything, so it's very tiny, very very tiny. And no matter what the camera angle is, you're going to lose sight of the puck. So you kind of have to know the game to know where it is, even when the boards are covering it up. Know where it's going, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So I always tell them like, well, the, but you got to see it live. It's the best live experience in sports without a doubt. But the problem is now um, is that it's gotten quite expensive to go. And, you know, you mentioned the the flyers of the 70s were a lunch pail group and they had lunch pail fans too. Right? That was the appeal. And now as it's become a little more costly to go, um, how many faces do you, do you still recognize from the 70s and 80s besides well, sign guy? First of all, uh, Zach, you are very well informed. I mean, it, it, it is what it is. And um, it, it has changed a lot since the early years. I mean, you know, coming up on 56, 57 years now that there have been fans. Started out, you know, uh, with not too many fans, a little more, a little more, a little more. Then we're selling out a building. And um, the same fans came every night. Same people came, sat in there as season ticket holders. Mm-hmm excuse me, adopted the team. Uh, uh, just, it was all part of their life. Um, when it started to become more expensive and when we changed from, uh, the spectrum to the Wells Fargo center, uh, it's two or three different banks of names have been on it. Um, the, uh, uh, it changed. It went a little more corporate, uh, and season ticket holders, if they kept their tickets might be assigned someplace different and might not have their friends around them. Mm-hmm. So they might sell off part of the game, part of the tickets in order to pay for the ticket. And, um, that changed. So I'd see some people there on a pretty regular basis, but nowhere near what it was through the Stanley cup years when your dad played. I mean, they were there every night. I'd see the same people. The glass was low behind me. I could stand up and look, talk to them face to face. Uh, which led to some of the challenges with the opposing teams like the Bruins and so forth uh, <laughs> going into the stands. Uh, you're familiar with that one. That's for sure. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, now the glass is, you know, way up there. And uh, fans react to players. I think we just passed the anniversary of that famous one where the fan went in the penalty box with Ty Domi. Uh, and the challenge there was, Toronto, the series with Toronto and Philly were just brutal. 
And if you lasted past that series, you might not be able to go, <laughs> win as many games in the next one. So they knew that th it was going to be tough. And the mandate went out for, to raise the glass in the penalty box around the, the Maple Leafs. Well, they, they put in Plexi, which is flexible, as you well know, rather than glass. Yes. And um, the stanchions that hold it were the same as they were before the Plexi went up. So there was about maybe 20, 24 inches height that wasn't supported. So when the guy leaned against the glass after Domi squirted him, he leaned, he leaned, he leaned. The glass snapped right along the stanchions. Boom. Perfect, perfect. The guy fell in the box, and Domi just pulled his jacket over his head and started to hit him. Kevin Collins, the linesman, jumped in. I was standing there. I said, oh, boy, here we go. And, <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Timer had the guy, and I mean, you know, we. If you don't know who Ty Domi is, just YouTube him. The guy was a lunatic. Not the biggest guy, but if I could compare him to a film character, he reminds me of Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. Just insane. He could take a punch, and guys he always enjoyed said, it. He yeah, liked he'd be, it. He'd take a couple and then hit you. And even if you got him good, they always said he was a cement head. I thought he was a pretty good guy. I mean, I, I got to know all the guys that uh, came in and fought everybody. And they're pretty good guys, mm -hmm. you know. They're okay. So there weren't make, many guys uh, that weren't. You'd make some small talk in the penalty box. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Because we, we didn't have glass in between, you know. It was wide open there. And then in the new building, they had glass there for when I went in to look at it, and I said, "We can't communicate like this," you know, with the officials. So I had to take the glass out. So it was still pretty good. And you hear a lot of good stuff down there, you know. I talked to uh, the first guest of uh, this. Um, uh, this podcast, Lou was was Dave Schultz, oh. and he told he told me something I never knew that he fought my dad uh, after they both left the Flyers, obviously. Uh, and that <laughs> that was that's so surreal to me to think of that. And I I tried to find it on YouTube, and unfortunately, I can I can find a video where they're both in fights at the same time, but I I can't find the one where they're actually fighting each other. And of course, uh, Dave said um, he gave my dad stitches. My dad says he very much misremembers that fight. My dad was actually uh, the winner. But I want to know what it's like for you, who who is you know kind of a teammate to these to these players. Like what what's what was it like the first time my dad came back as a penguin? Do you, do you sort of feel like this <laughs> longing, like you used to be my buddy here in the orange and black? Well, I know the O for a long time, uh, and um, you know, uh, wonderful guy. Still lives in the area. I see him uh, with alumni and uh, so forth. And, um, it was different with anybody that's been a good friend and a great friend for a long time when they show up with another team's colors on, especially Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, it wasn't his control. He's in a contract. He's going there, going to play and play hard. Uh, it just was different. I mean, we had Donald Brashear who was with other teams beating our guys up come and play with us. So there's, there's the opposite of that. Um, and Dave, I mean, you know, Dave had a hell of a career for a guy that, you know, wasn't that great a player, but became a better player. Had 20 goals one year back mm -hmm. in the old NHL, two hat tricks. You yeah. Know? Come on. It helps that he's playing with Bob, Bob Clark, you know, where he's getting the puck, but he's still going to make the play. So, um, and and uh, that's why I always like your dad because he could always make the play and along the boards when he'd have the puck be killing a penalty or something like that. They couldn't he get it off. Him. Could not get it off him. He just could keep it in his skates and create enough room, stick his ass out, and keep the guy away from the puck <laughs> and keep the puck in the right place. You know that you've seen it. I've seen it, and it's just it perfectly matches his personality. Cause he's just, he's the most stubborn person you could ever, ever meet. So of, of course, of course, I love it. along the boards is it's the perfect analogy for his entire persona. That's a good one. And I, That's a good one. Lou, I can't get enough of this moment. Um, it's, it's one of the, you know, clips that I watch over and over and over again. It's, it's the final and Bernie had a really great uh, little anecdote about, about this. The final 15 seconds or so of the first Stanley cup win. Bernie actually, he was uh, guest number two told me that uh, he was not paying attention. He was looking at the clock because Bernie Perrant is Bernie Perrant. 
And uh, <laughs> I guess Bobby Orr had s- sent a Hail Mary shot down, you know, from one uh, end of the rink to the other. And had it had it been on goal, it would have gone in because Bernie, with like five or six seconds yeah, to go, started heard, skating. Bernie's told me that story. <laughs> yeah, he started celebrating. But so then, he heard the boards. He heard the boards bang. He said, yeah, oh, geez. Yeah, but, well, woke him up. Obviously going to change the trajectory of his career quite quite a bit. But then, you know, the, talk about the emotion of that moment. And, you know, Schultz has a, a couple of other moments that really struck him. But that one, you know, with the – for me, the most iconic call in sports history, just the Flyers are going to win it. Gene Hart just losing his oh, mind. A oh crowd as loud as a crowd could possibly, possibly be. And you're there, obviously. So take me to that moment from you, uh, from in your perspective. Well, it started when uh, uh, the whole thought process with me started when uh, Bobby Orr interfered with Clarkey when, you know, he took a shot and went off somebody. Uh, at, at the blue line, and Clark started back break with a breakaway. And um, the next thing you know, uh, Orr pulls him down. Art Scoves, you know, pulls up his, his arms up. He sends an order to the box, and there's maybe two and a half minutes left. I don't know exactly what it was. So Orr, Orr is like apoplectic. He can he is cursing him. He's terrible. And um, Scove, you know, does what he does, and he goes. And uh, or sits there and he's steaming. And I'm saying to myself, you know what? We got a good shot here. We could win the Stanley Cup here today. Because I was in Boston when we won the game in Boston with Clark scored in mm-hmm. overtime. And uh, I'll be damned. I mean, next thing you know, War's out of the box. There's hardly any time left. And I'm saying to myself, oh, my God. And I've already done last minute. But I, you know, I was careful not to say last minute of play to the Stanley Cup. Because then you do get the goal scored. Yeah. Then the goal does. Bernie doesn't go past the net; it goes in the net, and then you're you're you know you're right. You're the then goat. You're Lou the Jinx. Yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I did the last minute, and that's what I'm thinking to myself. You know, we we we're gonna win. We're gonna win. And uh, I heard Gene later heard that famous thing. You know, the Flyers are gonna win. The Flyers win the Stanley Cup. Flyers win the Stanley Cup. They got have, actually have it on this little thing button you push. I have somewhere. I don't know where it is with my flyer stuff. And, uh, I mean, it was just chaos. And then because of the low glass, people came over the glass. And, you know, when the cup was awarded, uh, Dave probably told you. I mean, he was in the middle of it. Bernie and Clarky are skating it around. He's knocking people out of the way. You know, they're, they're trying to keep it clear because there was really no real skate around the ice with it. Right. They couldn't do it. Too many people in the ice. You know, guys grabbing sticks, you know, and just getting everything they can. But uh, it was, it was amazing. There's that such night. a beauty to that, though, that, to a beauty because they were such a team of the people oh. for the people to be on the ice with them. You know, maybe stealing some of their stuff, but who cares? It's well, they threw the sticks and gloves away. They didn't really care. So some people <laughs> have those. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that night, I can remember going in the room afterward. After I did like, you know, the, the warding of the cup and all this stuff like that, that happens with the Campbell and you do what you got to do. You do the stars, you do the, whoever gets the MVP. And then by then all the guys are in the room and they get in the room and there's like wall to wall people. It's like totally, you, you, I don't know if you were there. You might've been nah. you were in the room when we won the cup. No. no. Came over, came about Everybody 10 years else later. in the world was, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I'm not sure how old you were then. <laughs> pretty young negative 10 <laughs> negative 10 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you would not have been there <laughs> and um so uh that night i had agreed to do the opening game for fitz dixon's lacrosse team that was was going to be there so everybody you know i'm in the building and i got you know the orange blazer i got a half a jag on now i'm drinking champagne i'm drinking beers and then the next game, you know, my hair's all over the place, and I did that game. Now the guys wait, went wait, to wait, the wait. VR. Sorry, sorry. So there, the Flyers, the Flyers are they have just won the Stanley Cup. Yep. But they on the very same day they got to clear out and have a lacrosse game. Correct. It was and lacrosse you got to do that one too. <laughs> with the original Philadelphia Wings, were a bunch of Canadian guys that they brought in, and they had a couple of Americans. Yeah. The league was almost all Canadian because they played box across. 
So they had a game that night, and um, I agreed to do it. And uh, sure, I did it. And then, then after the game, I leave, and the guys are already over at Rexy's. You know, I don't know where the cup was. It might have been there. I don't remember. But I couldn't even get in. I mean, you know, people were outside. There were police there. There were, you know, they were just trying to keep the chaos down. And um, nobody was moving at all in the Black Horse Pike. So I went around and I, I parked far away in the back and walked in and came in the back. You know, I came in through the kitchen um, and, um, you know, was there till the guy said, you know, turn the lights, blinking the lights on and off. Please leave. <laughs> you know, but um, yeah. It's a night it you was, don't want uh, to end. Yeah. It was different. It was different. And uh, I'm so glad it was. It was a great experience. I mean, do, never do be you, duplicated for me. Do you even remember who won the Philadelphia Wings game? Uh, no. I have no <laughs> idea. But they were, that was great because it was like watching hockey without skates. So they had a guy named Carm Collins, who was an enforcer in Canada and they're all long haired guys. And mm. I mean, when he had a fight, man, he had a fight. It was like Dave Schultz pounding Dale Roth. So he <laughs> might've brought that up, uh, was when he did that. And, uh, but you know, it was without skates. So, you know, Holmgren could really fight, but he didn't have great balance, but, uh, you know, uh, he could. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And that this took place in the spectrum and it's, it's another great, thing that I miss terribly about the Flyers, you know, 75% of the games that I've attended in my life were at the spectrum. And I can still like, there's when I, when I, when I think about it, smells come first because it was, it was as clean as you would expect the spectrum to be. Yeah. Whereas, you know, stadiums now you walk in and it's got more of a polished mall feel to it. The spectrum was a little grimy. I mean, not as bad as the Boston gardens, but it had a grime to it and it should have like it again, that it, it's fully embodied the the Philadelphia Flyers. You could smoke pretty much anywhere. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. And uh, underneath was this restaurant called Ovations, which was you know my favorite place to uh, to eat in the world. Um, but I think for me, beyond the cup, the greatest moment that happened at the Spectrum because this was an international incident. And Lou, if you could just tell me your memories of of this and anything that you want to share about the spectrum, because there's I can't I can't get enough of it. Um, when they defeated the Russians uh, back in 1976, that was that was a bigger deal uh, worldwide than them even beating Bobby Orr and the Boston Bruins. Well, uh, when I knew the Russians were coming in. You know, it was well publicized, and um, then when when they really dominated some teams in the league, uh, it was left to uh, the Flyers, who lots of people hated, to uphold the NHL. And um, I took off some time. I was working in a bank. Took off some time to to be hanging out, and. Um, you know, traded pins with some guys. I mean, their captain came out, put a pin on me, and then stood there like I should give them something. So, <laughs> I don't know. I gave him, uh, I looked, and I, I was trying to show him I don't have anything, and I changed my pocket. It was a Kennedy half dollar, and he said, ooh, ooh. So I gave him a Kennedy half, right? <laughs> well, he leaves. He goes back in the room. Next thing I know, the door opens, and a whole bunch of guys look out, and he says, he points to me. They all come to me and start giving me pins like they all want the half dollar. <laughs> I'll come back. So I left, I went to the bank and I got a couple of rolls of halves and, you know, traded a lot of Russian guys for some pins. I still have them. Wow. And, um, it, it was really cool. But um, I was with the guys and took them downtown to shop a busload of them. I took, uh, I don't know, half a dozen guys jammed in my car to Pat Stakes. Wait, you took half a dozen of the Russian players to shop downtown? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, shop downtown was almost the whole team. Oh, so. The last game, so they bought right. they bought stereos, and jeans, and stuff they couldn't get. I didn't just do it; it was Joe Cadillac, and I went along with him. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we uh, uh, same thing with um, uh, with Pats. You know, the cheese sticks. They heard about cheese sticks, so I said, "Okay." So I get in the car and we go up. Now I'm teaching them to say one whip, 
And one <laughs> one they're going up. They're going up and they're saying, one wit. And then the guy says, whiz or, or, or American. And they like turn around, look at me, and say, what do I do now? Whiz. So everybody looks at me. And the, guy, the guy got the idea. You know, they don't look like jock jocks, but yeah. at that point, they were smell, They were pretty smelly. And, yeah. You know, they were real smelly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that worked. And um, then at the game itself, uh, when Eddie Van Imp lowered the boom on Karmelov, and Karmelov kind of looked his head up and then decided he better stay down. And, you know, I worked with that glass then, so the communication with the ref was like you and me here. Yeah. And I had an interpreter with me, a guy named Aggie Kuklowitz. He was from Air Canada, and he used to travel the Russian route. So he could, you know, the ref come over and he said, no, oh, um, they're all standing by the bench. And we say to him, nah, try to intimidate you into a call. And he says, yeah, he said, give him two minutes to delay the game. Okay. So I call the penalty two minutes to delay the game. Now they're pissed. And and that's when they made the decision to leave. You know, they all leave. And the ref comes back over and says to Lloyd Gilmore, I think it was. And he says to Aggie, he said, Aggie, what should, what should we do here? Aggie says, we better go talk to them. So went over and chatted. And I went with them nothing to do fans were going crazy and uh nobody knew what was going to happen and then when i get over there uh, a guy named boris who was our head guy was talking to aggie and here comes ed down the hallway ed snyder and he's got like his head up the veins are popping out of his neck he's all red and he's so mad and he goes right by some of the guards and busts open the door to the room and goes in their room now he was in there for about maybe 10 minutes, maybe not even that long, just seemed long. He came out and he said, they'll be out in a few minutes and we'll play. He went in and what he basically told them, I found out later, was they hadn't gotten paid. Mm -hmm. And Eagleson was there, Alan Eagleson, who set it all up. And they said, if you don't play this game, you don't get paid anything. So that's when they decided, you know, the old money American dollar won out. Yeah. And so they came back and then Joe Watson scored a goal, you know, which Fred Shiro said set their program back 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, Joe's one of Joe's favorite stories. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, uh, we're winning the game. Like four, four to one, I think it was, right? Four to one. Four to one. Yeah. And, and that's only because their goaltender played out of his mind. Oh, well. Yeah. Tretiak. Yeah. He's, he's a player and a half. And yeah. They became great friends with Clark, even though they were really adversaries. So he's been in here a few times. I've met him a couple times and a uh, good guy, you know, but he has a look of a, they, they look like they're Slavic guys. The look, the facial way they are, they, you know, um, and uh, a lot of, a lot of people come in and they're, they're friends, uh, you know, sort of half, you know, I, I remind them when I met them and they say, Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember. And then guys, some guys come in to play some of the later games when the Russians came here. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of reminding people. It's a smart thing to do because if they're gracious, they'll say, oh, sure. And if they're not real accomplished, they say, oh, I don't remember that. You know? <laughs> do you say, are they still impressed by the Kennedy half dollar? Uh, well, to add to that story, when I brought the dollars back, I gave all the guys Kennedy halves. And I was later told that when they went on the ice for practice, they took them all from their pants. They took them. The, the guys who were supposed to be doctors. Yeah. Thieves. Not doctors. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they were all guys, KGB guys. Oh, my God. All they wanted was vodka, you know, back to the hotel. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whatever. We back to the hotel, the, the, the Holiday Inn out of vodka. <laughs> Not the players so much, but the management. That's amazing. Lou, I, quote, unquote. Right. Lou, thank you so much for making some time uh, for me this morning. And um, this has been this has been great. And it's I, I can't wait to hear your voice live again once, uh, once I'm back in Philly and, and able to attend a game. Yeah. But make sure you find me, Zach, okay? Certainly will. Right now I'm in the last seat in the press box higher than anybody in the building. 
Okay. And I'll be there till probably next season, I would think. They're not going to bring us down yet. Right. Uh, I hope I get back down there. But uh, yeah. thank you for uh, get, reaching out to me and having me on the show. I've had, I've had a, a great time. So take Thanks. care and uh, let's go Flyers. Let's go Flyers. And Lou, I still like your voice. <laughs> that, talk, from a 10 year old plus right that's right okay. uh, talk to you soon my friend right off bye bye so long